Thanks so much, everyone. It's our pleasure to finally be here in Montreal with you at NorthSec. I'm Masashi Nishihara. This is my colleague, John Scott Railton. Uh, as Pierre David said, we are from the Citizen Lab, which is an interdisciplinary research group at the Monk School of Global Affairs, University of Toronto. We work on a variety of things, but one of the main research interests we have is trying to track and understand malware-enabled espionage campaigns targeting civil society. And I use that language, espionage campaign, on purpose, because the purpose of these operations is not to extract intellectual property, it's not financial gain, it is to collect sensitive information from groups doing political work that could threaten those in power. And over the next hour, we're going to break that down for you with some examples around the world. And we're going to do that in four ways. First, we're going to give you some provocative statements about the state of attacks against civil society. We're going to tell you a good story. We're going to give you some evidence from a number of case studies. And then we're going to zoom out and look at what some challenges are for these groups that are targeted and also for information security professionals like everyone in this room and how you might help out in this space. So for the provocative statement, let it pass it on to John. Always happy to be provocative, Ms. Hashi. Um, so the first and obvious point is that the internet is an essential part of civil society. Civil society, of course, is jargon for us. Um, what is civil society? It's not a clothing brand, although that exists. Um, civil society, the organizations, activists, citizen journalists, and others who defend rights, freedoms, democracy, pretty good people, uh, generally folks you want to help, but also people who are often thorns in the side of government and other groups in power. So another obvious point, this should be pretty familiar to people in the room, it is cheap to connect but expensive to secure. And nowhere is this more true than threadbare activist organizations doing their best to leverage new media to get their message out. With the predictable result that we watch every day, which is they are all owned or soon to be owned. So that was the provocative statement. Um, the good story uh, is two things, um, two birds, one stone. First, it's a good story, but it's also a little bit of a peek at how we at the Citizen Lab do an investigation. So I'm going to walk through that. Let me introduce you to a pretty cool person. This is Janet Hisnostra. She is an Ecuadorian journalist and television presenter and a royal-sized thorn in the side of the Ecuadorian government. Last year, Janet began receiving Spanish language because Ecuador, uh, Gmail notifications, account reset stuff, account error stuff, bread and butter phishing, why should anyone care, right? Well, for whatever reason, um, these made their way to me through a network of uh, connections, and I took a look at the phishing, and what caught my attention was that it wasn't like phishing generator phishing. This is the base domain, mgoogle.us, for those of you who can't read it. So I was like, that's interesting. Somebody went to the trouble to register this domain, hosting the phishing straight there, raw dogging it, why not? Um, let's look a little bit more. So we did. And the way we did this was kind of interesting. So Janet was our patient zero. And if you've got a bunch of people, you don't know if they're targeted, uh, you don't necessarily want to expose too much interesting stuff to them, you can't control their networks, you can't get on their boxes, what do you do? Well, it turns out you can stuff a large number of IOCs into a Gmail search link. So you can just create a URL um, that obviously doesn't look suspicious at all, right? But if people trust you enough to click this thing, this will search a Gmail inbox. And what we did was we had it search their inboxes for all the terms that I found in Janet's email that I associated with this group. And what did we find? Well, some flash update notifications, a bunch of other plug-in things, bread and butter, right? Again, okay, so we're looking at some kind of an interesting campaign, probably some malware. I couldn't get some of these things to drop. But then it got super weird. The same email addresses were also seeding links to political sites, political news sites, big, large-scale, fake news websites with original content in, like, Venezuela and Argentina, which was mind-blowing because usually things are pretty compartmented, right? Phishing, malware, not disinformation. So at this point, it's kind of like, okay, this is interesting. And then pay dirt. Uh, an email from a fake anti-Korea movement, so Korea, president of Ecuador, had an attachment, which is our Jambalam. 
Um, that attachment contained this utterly unconvincing uh, Word document. Um, and of course, stuffed in an OLE was a piece of malware. So we ran it, looked at it, and things got interesting. And as we began getting more samples, we discovered that we were looking at a ginormous campaign with malware going back to 2000 and late. Um, different rats, Cybergate, Extreme Rat, Alien Spy, adds a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and what distinguished these was not the uh, malware that they were using, but that they were packing them pretty effectively. So low to no AV detection, good stuff, large scale. So get on the multigos, start looking at command and control. Um, things are linked, unsurprisingly. Infrastructure gets reused all the way back to 2008 which is pretty, uh, uh, pretty brazen of this group. Um, but what was really interesting was this particular uh, domain, denews.sites.net, and that rang a um, uh, cowbell-sized bell because that same domain was associated with a malware attack uh, unsuccessful against Alberto Nisman, who is an Argentine prosecutor who uh, allegedly shot himself in the head twice the day before he was going to present a dossier against the Argentine president. Um, this was something that a colleague of mine, Morgan Marquis Bohr, had spotted. So now we knew that we were into something, but we also began to get paranoid, right? Uh-oh, it's bad people. And just around at that time, running this malware in some sandboxes, we started having an interesting moment. So one of the sandboxes was running. A researcher who shall remain nameless for their own security was uh, staring at the screen. And this uh, popped up. Uh, and it says, you like to play the spy. Well, watch out. It could cost you your life. For the next half hour, um, the operator behind the campaign issued the following threats, among others, uh, popping up on the screen to the researcher uh, in the sandbox environment. So, uh, right. Um, I'm not sure what my favorite is, um, but it's like, we're going to analyze your brain with a bullet and your family, too. Or, you know, some classic IRC stuff. You think you're living, but we have your IP, right? Now you're in trouble. Um, take your time and scan the processes, we're going to get you quickly. Well, they didn't get the researcher quickly, but what it did was flag to us uh, mm -hmm. something else that was interesting. So here's Martha Roldos, uh, an Ecuadorian activist, who had received physical threats in real life and via text message from a group that we believed to be the same group. So we realized that we were playing with a group that felt emboldened to make these threats. And this is kind of an interesting piece of information. Usually an operator, if they discover that they're sitting on a sandbox, is going to close things down, right? Where possible, restart the machine. Not these guys. Not at all. Um, for whatever reason, they felt so emboldened that from their C2, they were issuing these clear text threats. So from there, we dumped into a documenting phase. And what we tried to do was get a better and more systematic perspective of the threats. We pushed this Google link out, this Gmail link out fairly largely. And we began to see three broad categories of targets. We found journalists. We found, again, civil society, think clothing. Um, and finally, government threats, uh, specifically people who were uh, members of Ecuador's political opposition. So what was interesting about this campaign is that it had these three parts. There was malware, phishing, all standard and then disinformation, and it wasn't just in one country. It was in Venezuela, it was in Ecuador, it was in Argentina. I didn't mention it, but we found malware associated with Brazil going back to 2008. So, it wasn't me. Uh, so what's going on there? Is that you, Masashi? Uh, we began to get a sense that we were looking at a group that probably had the blessing of the regime that it was located in, um, felt emboldened as a result, to conduct illegal activities, and so emboldened that it would roll the same infrastructure for eight years um, against political targets throughout Latin America. So here we are, nice little map, right? Kind of the same story. Well, at this point, and because we're not private sector, right, we didn't just put this in a report and share it with a client um, or close things down. We got to do the fun part, which is, um, push the information out much more broadly. So we wrote a really cool report uh, and called them Pack Rat because they have rats that they pack, but also they hang on to domains forever. Um, and we worked with a news organization to do a story. So here's Janet again. One of the cool features of this was that we also dumped out all the IOCs and, of course, worked with uh, providers and hosters to take Pack Rat down. Interesting fact, further confirming, and I'm not going to uh, state while I'm standing up here who we think they are, after a couple of weeks of drama around this case, 
their infrastructure popped back up, and they're still rolling. So further confirming the fact that these people feel that they're very likely completely outside of the touch um, of uh, government or prosecution. So with that, we're going to move to some evidence which Masashi specializes in. So we're going to go over a number of case studies, but as we do this and do a couple deep dives into them, I want you guys to keep in mind the big picture, that throughout these cases from different regions around the world, the message is the same. Civil society is being constantly targeted. Well, how is this done? Well, there's one real road to your webcam, but there's three possible paths it can take. The first route is one that you know, everyone here hears a lot about, advanced persistent threat. What does that really mean? And you know, there's a number of different white papers out there that have uh, various definitions. We have this one. So we consider APT to be any national in-house capability that allows for development and operations. And you can think of a number of different well-resourced actors that can do this. For example, the NSA, China, Russia, et cetera. But that's just one route. The second route that John will talk about a little bit later is repurposing off-the-shelf malware for espionage operations, and we have some very interesting cases of how this is being done right now during the Syrian civil war. The third route is commercialization, and here we're looking at misuse, important word there, and we'll get back to that later, of lawful intercept tools, such as Finn Fisher and hacking team that y'all might have heard about. But let's look at APT. So again, APT, buzzword, lots of people say it, lots of people play it, what does it mean? In a lot of the reports, you'll see discussion of attacks against governments, attacks against the private sector, but what about civil society? Well, we had that question, and we did a study that we released a couple years ago called Communities at Risk. So what were we looking at in that study? Well, we had 10 civil society groups, the majority of which were doing activities related to China, looking at human rights issues uh, in the region, looking at minority ethnic groups such as Tibetans, and we'll get back to that a bit later. So just keep that in mind as we go through these examples. So we worked with these groups for over four years, and we wanted to understand how they're being targeted, how they were reacting to it, and both the technical and political side of these kinds of attacks. And we collected over 2,000 pieces of malware, uh, from 44 different malware families. So this is pretty interesting. This is a small sample, 10 groups, but you can see they're getting a lot of stuff. So what does this all mean? Well, finding number one. These targeted operations use the minimum necessary sophistication, and we'll unpack that in a minute. And the most important thing to consider here is the first target is the human on the other side of the keyboard. And unfortunately, all of us in this room have what we like to call for everyday vulnerabilities, and they're very hard to guard against. So what you see here is all of the CVEs of the malware that we collected over four years. The little orange dots are unique attacks, and the gray lines are when that CVE was announced. And I want to draw your attention to the two blobs you'll see here. So that's 2010-3333, and 2012-0158, if anyone here is tracking these kind of actors, you know what I'm talking about, and you see a pivot from 33-33 to 0158. Importantly, these are not zero days. These are old days, like I'm talking old, and you see they're still being used. So you see that line there, and then you see the activity continue. We did get one zero day, so you see here the attack happened before the CVE announcement, but this is an important thing to underline because these are old days, and you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Why would you burn a sophisticated capability against targets that are frankly usually soft targets? So again, over four years of collection, only one zero day. And if you look at 2012-0158, that was patched since April 10th, 2012, but we still saw operators use it for over a year and a half after it was patched. So what does that mean? it means it was probably working because the targets they were going after did not have updates on their machines. Perhaps they're running pirated versions of Windows and so forth. So again, get in the attacker mindset. They're lazy just like everybody else. Let's just do what works. So we wanted to do a more rigorous analysis of the data set that we had. So we created something called the Targeted Threat Index. And the idea here is we want to characterize and quantify our data set and try to understand what the severity of them are, both from a social engineering perspective and also, of course, from a technical perspective. So here's how the metric works. It's calculated in two parts. 
you take a base value score of how sophisticated the social engineering is, and then you have a technical sophistication multiplier. We use a multiplier because the amount of resources, time, effort, in some cases money, to create a custom piece of malware for a target can be significant. So just keep that in mind. And you take those together and you get a TTI score. So that's a bit abstract, so let's break down how this works. So here's our base value of social engineering. We go from zero to five. And I'll show you some examples to better illustrate what we're looking at. So all of these are real lures sent to groups that we worked with. So here you see the value of one, which means it's been targeted, but it's not customized. And in this case, the email is inviting you to, I guess, some kind of event. There's not really much information here. It did have malware, but you know, it's not so convincing. Probably wouldn't open that. Well, how about this one? So this is a two. It's targeted and poorly customized. In this case, it was sent to a Tibetan human rights group. It's about an issue that Tibetan groups care about. But again, it's coming from someone you don't know. It doesn't look like a real person. Not a lot of pertinent details here. I don't know if I'd click that. But let's up this a bit. So now you have a three which is targeted and customized. Now we're getting a little more interesting. This person that's named here is a real person. That is their real email. This, in fact, could be a real message that they sent that was collected in previous operations. If you are working in the Tibetan community and you got this at your workplace, seems pretty legit. I might click that. But let's up it even more. So now we're looking at four. It's targeted, it's personalized, the salutation is addressed directly to the target, and this one is particularly interesting because you can see there are people on the other side of this putting some consideration into the targeting. So in this case, it says it's from a Mr. Cheng Li, who is director of research at a China center at Brookings Institution. Well, if you just Googled uh, this title, you'll find this gentleman here. Looks legit, you know, he's got his title. Okay, that's interesting. But let's take a little bit of a closer look at this email. So, you know, for those of you paying attention out there in the crowd, you might see some funny things. Like, first of all, you know, someone from Brookings is sending from AOL. Okay, weird. Uh, it's unsolicited, so the person that received this has never met this person before. They are a well-known China scholar, so it's like, wow, they want my opinion as a Tibetan activist on an important Tibetan issue. And you can even see at the bottom, it says, thank you again and happy Tiblosar, which is Tibetan New Year. Interesting. And he really, really, really wants you to open this file. So let's just keep that all in mind. But you know what? Two can play this game. So we wrote back Mr. Cheng Li with the permission of the targeted individual, and we said, you know, we'd love to help out, but we're having a bit of a problem with the attachment. Maybe it's because we're on a Mac, you know, Chinese character fonts, computers, I don't know. And, you know, it took a little while for Cheng Li to respond, but hey, he's a busy man. He was traveling, you know, okay, that's, that's legit. And he has another interesting thing to send us. And the interesting thing here is if you clicked on this URL, it would look at your user agent and what operating system you're on. And if you're on a Windows, hey, have some Windows malware. But if you're on a Mac, oh, we got some nice, fresh OSX malware just for you. So no, sir, thank you. Thank you very much. So that's a four. Wow, people on that other side, they're really trying to work to get you to click. What's a five? So it's targeted and it's highly personalized. In fact, it's so personalized, we can't ethically show you a real example. But here's a little story of a real example. So you're a NGO and you get an email from your actual funder and the actual program officer from that funding organization. And they say, I have an important update for a meeting that we're having two weeks from now, which is a real meeting which was already scheduled. I don't know about you guys, I would probably click that. So that's the social engineering. Across our data set, you'll see here, these are all the scores. We saw a lot of threes, which were pretty good. We saw some fours and fives, but the majority were threes. That means there's a lot of effort being done in these operations to make these emails seem legitimate. But what about the technical side of it? So again, we use a multiplier, and what we're looking at here is the level of effort to obfuscate the code inside the binaries themselves and to obfuscate the functionality when it's on the network. Why do we look at obfuscation? Well, all the malware we're looking at, the functionality is essentially the same. They're all rats, they're all looking to do the same thing, and we choose 
obfuscation because it makes it harder to analyze, which makes our lives harder. It's harder to find it on the network, which makes defenders' lives harder. And again, it's a way to, um, uh, to see the differences between the malware because the functionality is mostly the same. A two is like Finn Fisher hacking team level, professional software development. And we didn't see any of these in this data set, but we'll talk more about what that stuff looks like in a bit. So we saw a lot of ones, a lot of 1.25s, uh, some 1.5. So it's not very technically sophisticated. Overall, if you look at our scores and you put these together, the highest TTI scores were based on high levels of social engineering rather than technical sophistication. So just remember, that's where the effort is going in these particular operations. And why? Because it works. Why up the technical sophistication if you don't have to? Okay, so that was finding one. Finding two. Who's doing this? Well, we found that the same groups that are targeting private sector and governments that we hear a lot about in all the white papers that are out there are also targeting civil society. So who runs these ops? Well, looking at the TTPs, looking at the malware, looking at shared infrastructure, we identified 10 distinct espionage campaigns and threat actors, four of which are known to target government and private sector. And we know that because of previous reporting by our friends in industry and other research groups. So here are some of them. How many people know NetTraveler? Okay, not a lot of NetTraveler fans in the audience, but they have targeted 350 government and industry and NGO groups. Another one, DTL Group, reported by our friends at FireEye, they have targeted 11 different government and industry verticals. PlugX, again, a very um, prolific group, has targeted a number of government and private sector groups, as well as NGOs. Perhaps the most significant one we found were these guys, APT1, which I'm sure everyone in the audience knows. It was reported by Mandiant, apparently linked to a specific unit of the PLA, and interestingly, recently the Department of Justice, the United States, served an indictment to five individuals who were apparently connected to this operation. If you read that indictment and the Mandiant report, you'll see all kinds of discussion of industry and government targets, but you won't see any mention of civil society. However, we saw them targeting one of our Tibetan groups and also saw an active compromise against a large NGO, which is interesting. It has over 1,000 employees, multiple offices, enterprise-level security, help desk the works, probably similar to some of the networks that you guys look at on your day job. And what we saw here is the APT1 operators had access to the network of the headquarters of this organization for over eight months. What did they do when they had access? Well, you know, the typical stuff. They moved laterally, they impersonated staff, they installed rats, and they exfiltrated data. Again, you'll see this discussed in the Mandiant Report, but not within an NGO group, which is important. So What's that, an NGO? A non-governmental organization. So finally, we'll look at finding three. And that's these operators constantly adapt. And we already saw that with our friend Cheng Li and the nice little pivot they did there. But what's interesting is these adaptations are often in response to defensive measures from the targeted groups. And I just want to share a story about the Tibetan community. Now, this is a community that have been facing these kinds of attacks for over a decade. They are the canaries in the coal mines, so to speak. And they are not laying down on this. They're trying to empower their community through education and through trainings to better equip them with a different mindset. This is a quote from one of the Tibetan trainers. And change their behaviors. And they're doing this really based on data. So in our study, we found that file attachments sent in emails were the most common vector for Tibetan organizations. In fact, two of these groups, if they simply didn't open attachments, they would have mitigated 95% of the threats that they receive in over four years. So that's interesting. So the Tibetan community started this campaign called Detach from Attachments, a nice play on a little piece of Buddhist wisdom that we should all take. And it had very simple message and three steps. Number one, stop opening attachments. Number two, stop sending attachments. Number three, if you must share a file through email, why don't you try something like Google Drive or Dropbox or some other cloud-based solution? Okay, so that's interesting. You know, we're looking at 95% mitigation here through a simple behavioral change. But you know what? The attackers were paying attention to. So in 2014, we saw the first use 
of Google Drive links as a malware vector. This one's particularly interesting because it's trying to send you a binary of a Tibetan uh, dictionary program, but of course that was also packaged with malware. So this was the first time we saw it, but the trend continues. So you fast forward a year later, we saw a whole campaign again, sending these links out uh, through Google Drive. And importantly, it's not just Tibetans. So in some more recent work we've done, tracking uh, targeted operations against environmental groups working in Burma, they're also receiving Google Drive links. And in our most recent publication, uh, we also saw the same vector used against pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong. So that was route one. I'm gonna pass it off to John now for a different route to your webcam. So route two, commercial off the shelf, also known as my cousin knows computers and I'm fighting a war and he's gonna help me fight it. Um, so in the background are a bunch of Syrians sitting on the ground drinking tea and doing stuff with their computers. Uh, so finding number four, harm is not expensive. Um, Masashi just talked about nation state uh, in-house approaches. Turns out you can go a long way with commercial over the shelf, off the shelf malware. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about one group um, that's really done more than everyone else um, to uh, explore that. So back in the day, 2011, beginning of the thing that ended up being called the Syrian Civil War. Back then it was a revolution. People were getting onto the streets. And as that happened, parts of Syria were no longer under the control of the Syrian regime, right? So they're no longer sitting on the network. So that how do they regain visibility uh, into the groups that they want to target? Well, easy malware. Now they didn't have a lot of like existing relationships with malware vendors at that moment. Um, which we'll talk about in a minute. I guess I'll talk about. Um, so what did they do? Well, they had people who had some degree of sophistication, and they just started rolling rats with social engineering. And the two groups doing that, one everybody's heard about, the Syrian Electronic Army. One not everybody has heard about, malware groups working for the Syrian regime. So that's 2011, long time ago. I barely had facial hair. Fast forward a few years, um, and we've got a bunch more groups all doing the same thing. So Lebanese groups targeting the Syrian opposition, and ISIS and Islamist groups targeting the Syrian opposition. There are more, but this is just a couple. What's interesting is that despite the proliferation of groups who all want to know what the opposition is doing for targeting, they're basically rolling the same TTPs, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now, I just had to put in this slide. So Syrian Electronic Army 2016, big update, very exciting. Indictment rolls down, some pictures, some names, now public. So here are two members of the Syrian Electronic Army. And I wouldn't normally read from a slide, but this is just altogether too good. So here's an indictment against the SEA for blackmail, which it turns out they were doing on the side. So Dardar, uh, who's the guy on the right, um, had hacked a bunch of companies in Europe and was trying to extort them uh, for consulting fees. Um, and this is just like, I guess if you're gonna do that, this is probably not how you wanna do it. So Dardar demanded further payments, which he referred to as blackmail, which is really not what you wanna do if you're blackmailing somebody. And then just like the ultimate moment of Zen, Dardar, in the course of his communications with representatives from Victim One, which is a large institution, occasionally mentioned his affiliation with the Syrian Electronic Army and the fact that he was wanted by the FBI. Which if you're trying to convince a large risk averse company to give you some money is like, I don't know, next level. Um, despite that, the Syrian Electronic Army is rolling along, targeting the opposition uh, as recently as this week, actually. Um, new attacks, and what's really exercising them at the moment is trying to target mobile phones. The reason for this is that the Syrian opposition, a lot of them are in places that don't have good internet connectivity, but also not uh, stable electricity. So everybody's moving their comms to phones, and all their threat actors are moving there. Let's talk about the malware group. Now, these are some super elite gentlemen, right? Um, here are their pictures, which they inj injudiciously posted on social media. Um, somewhere under different names. Um, so anyways, these are some pictures of the guys. Um, and when they're not doing malware, they're also shooting guns at these people, which is a characteristic of this kind of group, and I think it's fair to analogize it to a militia. Online, not a lot of sophistication, not necessarily uniform wearing, shooting guns on behalf of somebody, digital or otherwise. So how do these malware groups target the Syrian opposition? What are they doing? Well, it turns out that the opposition is growing increasingly paranoid of the possibility that it's being targeted. So. Malware actors realize this and push out a whole bunch of fake security tools and circumvention tools into opposition forums. So, of course, right, like if people are afraid of things, why not give them like a maliciously bundled circumvention tool or a maliciously bundled VPN client or Amazon Internet Security, which is a fake uh, AV scanner, which probably works. Um, 
But the very best one ever is uh, there was a rumor in the Syrian opposition a couple years ago that Skype was not safe, which is obviously sort of true. Um, and uh, the malware actors, uh, in a moment of genius, released a Skype encryption program, which you can see on the right of this slide. You'd run this executable, and uh, you'd click the button, and it would say, like, congratulations, your Skype call is encrypted. Um, Nart Villeneuve, a friend of the lab, now FireEye, formerly Trend Micro, um, released uh, this report, but we had a great laugh when we saw this. Just absolute brilliance. So what are these things bundled with? Um, they're bundled with rats, really not sophisticated rats, extreme rat, shadow tech rat, NJ rat, black shades and that, and a bunch of others. These guys have like the shallowest technical pockets in the world. Like they go to forums and download stuff and bundle it. But it turns out, right, that if you're targeting an opposition group that's not exactly rolling sophisticated secure systems, this works. How well does it work? Well, we all know that someone will always click when you target an organization, right? And the consistent finding of studies about Social engineering is that if it's fairly well targeted, 40 to 60% of people-ish click, right? Um, this is not that different for uh, studies that have been done in the Syrian opposition. But how well does this really work? Um, so I had this picture of a woman for the Lebanese groups earlier, uh, and I'll tell you why. So this is a female avatar who used uh, Skypes and the Facebooks um, to seduce uh, generals and other members of the Syrian uh, fighting opposition, and just brought home bacon. Um, 64 Skype account databases. It turns out that a really good way, if you want to know how an opposition that's heavily reliant on Skype operates, is you target their machines with a rat, and then rather than staying persistent, you just exfil the Skype databases, which have it all. Um, well, this group didn't really protect uh, their exfil very well, um, and I and uh, two very smart folks at FireEye um, did a report on this. Uh, their total haul was 240,000 individual Skype messages, um, the comms backbone of the Syrian opposition. Everything from like the movement of weapons to meetings that were about to take place to political stuff and negotiations. So what does that look like? Well, here are 12,000 dots, uh, all geffied up, right? A little uh, social network analysis, because I'm fancy. Um, this is uh, data that I generated from their exfil. Uh, and I mapped out the way that the targeting actually worked inside this group. So you've got like a couple people who click first, right? So the attackers infected these people, and then they pivoted around throughout the opposition and nailed some higher profile people who were engaged in comms with a lot of other folks. And that's how they did it, right? The reality is opposition groups work in groups and get targeted as groups, right? It's not an individual thing, it's an organizational thing, despite the fact that the groups that we're looking at don't exactly have a centralized IT policy. So here's the attacker's eye view of uh, some of these targeted Syrians, right? Um, so here's a guy, we're looking at the attacker's screen, looking at the victim's screen. Um, you know, it'd be really nice if the victim like tilted the webcam a little bit, because uh, the laptop's kind of badly focused there. Um, and here we have an image of the uh, attacker using a combination of a popped laptop and its webcam, and then a little bit of open source intelligence gathering on Facebook to try to ID uh, their target, who they um, connected with a fighter working with the um, Syrian opposition. So pretty heavy-duty targeting. Um, but what they're getting is not just uh, porn browsing history, although that made up a good chunk of the exfil, um, but a bunch of other stuff. The information that they use, that they get, uh, has been used in military raids, targeted assassinations, not just in Syria, but also in Turkey. Targeted bombing, right? You want to know where an opposition command center is. Humiliation operations. I mentioned porn earlier. Um, turns out, if you're a commander and you're an Islamist, that a bunch of videos of you um, doing the nasty in front of your webcam while browsing stuff, really efficient um, at uh, causing your colleagues to lose confidence in you. And uh, access to sensitive negotiations. So basically, like, wholesale catastrophic, oh no, compromise, death and beyond, right? These are all cases where there's documented evidence. So this isn't just talk changing tack a little bit. Route three to your webcam, commercialization. So um, this is some really fun stuff. It turns out that every government wants access to secured communications, right? Uh, both to block them and to filter them, but also um, to gain access to denied devices. And some of it's lawful um, and uh, done with a lot of careful oversight. Some of it's not. 
And there's a giant industry of companies, some you may be familiar with, like perhaps Finn Fisher or Hacking Team, some perhaps a less so, like Advanced German Technology, which also sounded like a bad BMW advertising campaign, um, selling uh, hacking tools and monitoring tools uh, to .gov, um, and not just Western governments, but anybody who can pay. So Finding Five, commercial malware has proliferated globally. So this is some stuff that um, I and my colleague Bill Marzak, Claudio Guarneri, and Morgan Marquis Bohr have done. And what we've done is documented the global proliferation of this stuff and also its abuse potential. So what's happening? Well, companies uh, that sell basically lawful intercept malware, which is just a fancy turn of phrase. It borrows the term lawful interception from telco interception, spins it a little bit, and describes it as something that you can do with malware. They're basically just selling sophisticated malware with good obfuscation and persistence. And their pitch to governments is, right, you have new challenges today. A lot of people's comms are encrypted. Uh, some of the stuff that you want is on device. You want to be stealth. You want to be untraceable. You want to be hidden. Right? Buy our stuff. Or don't. Uh, so how do, com how do countries use this? Well, here's some real examples, right? So this is uh, an email. So email, attachment, nuts and bolts, malware seeding. But also just about every other vector you can think of, right? Um, download poisoning, uh, over-the-air updates, uh, provided, of course, that you can pay. And an increasing number of governments are paying. So what does this look like from the operator's eye view? Well, this is some leaked stuff uh, from Hacking Team. So here they are with the God's eye view of uh, this little target here, right? Scroll back and forth, look at movement, look at contacts, uh, cross time, look at social network, um, browsing stuff, all the things that you can get when you're sitting on people's devices. And one of the key pitches that these companies make that, you know, the sort of like rat forums can't is uh, defense against antivirus. So when they sell, they'll typically sell a certification that's like for the given period of our contract, your stuff is going to be non-detectable by AV. We guarantee it. And uh, usually there's also like some kind of an O-Day service as part of the package. Now, of course, that feels like a challenge. Um, and uh, some of my brilliant colleagues and I um, have discovered that it turns out, right, if you have a collection infrastructure and it touches the internet, it too can be enumerated. Uh, so we did that. Um, and uh, this was an enumeration that we did in uh, 2014 that came up with 21 suspected government users. We said suspected, but um, we'll just say this is where the final chain of the obfuscation proxies uh, was located, right? So some countries here that are perhaps reassuring and then some that are definitely not. Like, uh, I can't imagine that Nigeria is going to be, like, heavily overseen in terms of how it uses surveillance powers, or Egypt, or Mexico, or really anything else in this map. Um, so let's talk about real cases, though. So this is Hisham. Hisham is a Moroccan journalist working with a Moroccan journalism organization. And he and a bunch of his colleagues doing nothing illegal other than documenting civil rights abuses by the Moroccan government and arguing for the freedom of the press were successfully targeted with hacking teams malware. Right. Ethiopia. Ethiopia has a big diaspora, um, as anyone who's ever taken a taxi cab in Washington, D.C. will know. And um, that diaspora, among other things, has its own journalists, serious news organizations. Um, and perhaps the most paranoid group about the diaspora is the Ethiopian government, which bought hacking team and Finn Fisher malware, always wanted to hedge its bets, um, and has been systematically targeting journalists in its opposition. Now, something happened last year. Um, which was really interesting, which is hacking team became hacked team um, and got themselves doxxed massively. Um, so here's a tweet that happened last year on their Twitter feed. Since we have nothing to hide, we're publishing all of our emails, files, and source code, right? It's the ultimate open source moment. Uh, there was a lot of stuff in that dump um, that was interesting. Among other things, it confirmed our findings and added countries to the list. It also added new victims. We discovered that uh, their stuff had also been used to target journalists in Ecuador and many other places. The key thing is, the industry argument about a lot of this stuff is, it's lawful intercept, it's sold to governments who are going to oversee how it's used and use it for child pornography and anti-terrorism investigations. The reality, of course, is if you give a government, especially a government with an issue with oversight and corruption and paranoid leadership, the ability to conduct secret surveillance, history tells us they will abuse it. They also, at Hacking Team, think a lot about us. Um, so uh, it's always very interesting when you find yourself talked about, um, especially in a document dump. So uh, here we were reading about ourselves, um, Prof. Diebert, director of Citizen Lab, right? 
he seems to think that he's running a regulatory organization that has some authority over our worldwide business, right? They'd really prefer it if we just leave them alone. And uh, in fact, um, despite the documented use of their tool against completely undeserving victims in many countries around the world, their narrative, of course, is we're the victims, right? We got hacked. So finding six. We've been doing this work since 2012, uh, targeting commercial malware, and I'd love to talk to you more about that in questions. Uh, and what we've discovered, every time we look, every surface we scratch, more countries are buying, right? Post Snowden revelations, every country kind of knows what they could get, right? And everyone would like to buy it. And a lot of these companies uh, have recognized this as a market opportunity. So repressive regimes have learned quickly and are sharing a lot of information to each other about what you might do to preserve um, your government. I've been talking about hacking team. There are a bunch of others. Uh, FinFisher, known to many people in the room, is also used widely. Um, here's a scan that we did last year looking at uh, the endpoints of their obfuscation proxy systems. Um, bunch of users, many of them likely to use these tools in abusive ways. So we talked about three routes to your webcam, and what I'd like to do now is roll it over to my colleague Masashi to talk about some interesting challenges. So first, we want to think about the challenges facing civil society, the community that we at the Citizen Lab care about. And going forward, what's going to be the state of these threats? Well, I hope you can all uh, have taken the observation that we've tried to share with you that the barriers to entry for conducting espionage operations are dropping. You don't need a tailored access operations Super lead group. Low. You don't need you know, this in-house development capability anymore. If you have money, you can buy these things. You can even just take a rat from some forum and have some really significant impacts in the real world. So the barriers to entries are low. So what does that mean? We think it means that we're going to see a lot more threats against civil society groups around the world. This is not just something for groups in certain communities. This is not just something for groups that are rubbing certain powerful actors the wrong way. This is something we're going to see in a lot of places, yeah. and we're going to see it very soon. So what about another observation? Well, organization political mobilization is going mobile. In many of the countries and regions in the world that we're interested in, people don't have a desktop computer. They have a pocket computer. And this is where their life is. This is where they're organizing their activities. This is where their personal life is. This is where their professional life is. And this is where they're going to get targeted. So prediction, more threats against mobile very soon. And it's probably already started. So these are just some general ideas of what's happening around civil society. How does this affect all of you in the room? So y'all curious? Y'all want to know what you can do? I know some of you do. I know you're thinking. I can hear it. I can feel it. Um, one of the big challenges that I've observed over the past couple of years, um, we get a lot of people approaching us who are like, hey, what you do is really cool. Uh, how can we help, right? I've got some skills. I can reverse the things. Um, we like that. One of the challenges that people often face if they've got some skills or a desire to do engagement is actually the relationship process. How to actually connect with groups who need help. Um, there are things that people in this room do in hardware, and then there are things that y'all do in software, like relationship management. Some of those things can be very challenging. And one of the things that we've observed is that when people who have great intentions and want to help cast out looking for a way to do it, um, unless you're connected with some fairly solid feedback about what needs actually look like and about what problems are, you can waste effort, you can get frustrated, uh, it can be challenging to actually know if you're accomplishing things. And I know for a fact that a bunch of security companies have tried to do pro bono stuff and found the sort of how to connect with real targeted groups to be one of the biggest challenges. It's a source of risk, reputational risk, a bunch of other concerns. So our recommendation is to connect with a group that has those relationships um, and perhaps good judgment, allegedly at least. Um, so we're hiring, uh, and we're one of those groups. We'd like to think so. Um, but we also know the space pretty well. Um, and if people sitting in the room find this at all enticing or would just like to jam on some mobile reversing, right, the aforementioned, especially APKs, um, that we're looking at, um, there are plenty of opportunities to do so. So I'd encourage you to grab my colleague, Masashi, or if you must, me, no, I'm just kidding, um, and uh, ask us. Um, and we can probably connect you either to somebody who's interested um, or talk to you more about uh, connecting and working with us. So with that, we wanted to leave time for questions. Um, 
So we'd like to do our thanks. Yeah, so uh, big thanks, first of all, to the NorthSec organizers. It's awesome being here with all of you. You can check out all our reports online at our website. And, you know, research is a team sport at the Citizen Lab. There's a lot of collaborators and team members that made all this research possible. Their names are listed there. So thanks to our team and collaborators, and thank all of you for your attention. Yeah, teamwork makes the dream work. That's right. All right thanks, guys.